You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent, good. That's the first thing that's gone right this morning. I hope you're all, uh, all doing very well and isn't it nice to be here uh, in person in a venue. Um, welcome to Rail Decarb 21 and welcome to our remote audience. There are uh, another 40 or 50 people, I believe, uh, registered to join us online um, and some people will be joining us throughout the day in person as well. Yep, it's already very well, I can see. At least the mic works. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sam Bennett uh, and I'm a Technical and Innovation Manager at RIA and I'll be chairing this event and this session. And I'm ably assisted uh, by Milda, who's over there in the corner and she'll be chairing one of the later sessions and Carl King, who you may have met at breakfast. And if you didn't go to breakfast, I believe he's been looking after our exhibitors outside. Uh, so if you'd like to talk to any anything about RIA or what we do, then find one of us in one of the breaks if we're not running about clapping uh, and we'd love to chat to you about that. Got a few housekeeping points for you. Um, so we need to ask you to download and register on the Protect Scotland app, please. Um, I've told this is infinitely better than the NHS England app. Um, I couldn't get it to work, but told it's better. Uh, Scotland is still observing a one metre social distancing, so please ensure you do that when networking outside. Uh, face masks are mandatory in this building, uh, but we've got permission for presenters not to have a face mask on because we're further away. This is a paper free event and in an ecological building that seems apt. Uh, the agenda is available on the event page and I'll share a mini agenda in each session so you can see who's going to be on and the timings. Uh, and we'll share the attendee list, including email addresses electronically immediately after this session. If anybody does not want their email address to be shared with all other attendees, you need to find me immediately at the close of this session and I will redact you from that list. Otherwise, the, that will be going around at the end of this session. Uh, we've also taken steps to re reduce touch transmission. This was asked by the venue. Uh, so we discourage the use of business cards, uh, but you can take a photo of them from a meter's distance, maybe. Uh, and we have no name badge table to reduce that point of contact as well. I should also add that the event is being broadcast online and it's being recorded for later distribution. Um, so it will be available for free on the real website. Uh, and at the paper free event, the venue gave me a piece of paper last minute to say that there are no planned fire alarm tests. So if a fire alarm does sound, treat it as genuine and make your way to the nearest fire exits in a calm and orderly manner. So a big thank you to our sponsors for this event. All of the Unlocking Innovation series of events that RIA run are free on the door and they are open to everybody, not just RIA members. But of course, there is a huge cost associated with getting a venue like this, um, all the exhibition tables and the catering. So these events wouldn't be possible without our kind sponsors. So first of all, TP Group, who are our headline sponsor, and they've uh, sponsored the event overall and given us some great support, um, helped us choose some really good speakers and approach them. Uh, Arcadis have kindly sponsored the industrial uh, traction panel sessions, so we've got some sev uh, several different breakout rooms later, um, so we can brief on hydrogen, battery and electrification all at the same time. Obviously that has an additional cost implication because we're hiring more rooms, so thank you very much to Arcadis. And the UI programme has uh, long-term partners and support in Network Rail, who are exhibiting here today. Uh, and Ukraine, and there's several Ukraine members in the audience I know, so thank you to you guys. Don't forget that these events are CPD eligible um, and they are available free online, so if you guys have any colleagues back at your host organisations who you think would benefit from seeing the presentations today, uh, they can watch those recordings and they can log that as CPD time, so please do forward on those links afterwards. RIA have just launched um, a local offering. We're launching local offerings uh, across the country in the different regions. Um, and RIA Scotland is the first of those regions that we are concentrating on. So we're going to be running a series of events and creating a local presence and a local resource in Scotland. Um, that resource will amount to lobbying intelligence, uh, technical support and lots of networking events up here. So RIA no longer wants to be just a traditional London centric organisation. We want to be organising a lot of events in the regions to suit kind of the new structure of the railway, if you will. As examples of this, we've got two events coming up. These are RIA member only events. So if you're not a RIA member and you'd like to be, 
And if you'd like to come to these events, uh, find one of the rear team and we can talk to you about membership options. Um, on the 9th of November, we've got the Trailblazers at COP26. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, it's basically beer on a train, but it's a battery train. So it's beer on a battery train, and that's going to be out of Glasgow Central Station, 90 minutes. Trailblazers is a networking event for people new to our industry and, the, and senior people. So we ask each senior person who comes along to bring a junior person in their organisation and perhaps give them an, an opportunity to network that they might not otherwise have had. It's a really good event. I went to one in York last week. I was recovering for three days afterwards. Uh, and on the 22nd of November, we've got the Rear Scotland Roundtable and Workshop. We've already got Bill Reeve and Alex Hines lined up for that. We've got a couple of other speakers in the pipeline, but I didn't quite get permission to put them on the slide because they've not confirmed yet. Uh, so if you are interested in those events, you can sign up on our website if you're a Rear member. If not, talk to one of the Rear team. So without further ado, we have a packed agenda for excellent speakers today. Um, I say I will put on the screen a agenda at the start of each session so you can see exactly who's speaking. The full agenda is available on the event page on our website. And <coughs> I'd like to introduce now um, for our keynote session, uh, Joe Warrington from Network Rail, who will presenting, present on our journey to a zero carbon and sustainable railway. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Here's Sam. your quick Thank you. Right, I'm going to time myself because I realised that um, I thought I had longer than I have got. So um, I'm going to have to canter through uh, my presentation today. But hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jo Lewington. Um, I'm delighted to be up here in Glasgow and actually seeing people in person uh, for the first time in a long time. Um, as Chief Environment and Sustainability Officer at Network Rail, um, I am extremely proud to be leading on the implementation of Network Rail's environmental sustainability strategy uh, to achieve net zero carbon by 2050 in England and Wales and by 2045 up here in Scotland. I'm also really proud to be part of the wider industry team in delivering world class environmental and sustainability performance and compliance. We want to put our passengers and freight users first to help them make the right sustainable transport choices. So today I'm going to take us on a journey, a journey that will see our railway become the cleanest, greenest form of mass transport in the UK. And I'm using this platform to urge you to get on board so that we can achieve this together. So we've all been on a journey to get here today and some have been travelling for longer than others. And when I look back at my career in the railway, I have to confess I'm feeling quite old. My railway journey started in 1993 as a student from South Bank University in London. It was a year that I'll never forget. Uh, I vividly remember the huge change that was happening and it was the year that British Rail became Railtrack under privatisation, a year of intense preparation and uncertainty about what the future held. And today I cannot help but feel a sense of deja vu as we now prepare for the creation of Great British Railways and I'm proud to be part of the railway family and really excited for what the future holds and the opportunity that a revitalised and united rail industry presents, and I hope you are too. So like privatisation back in 1994, a period of significant change is now with us, but with change comes opportunity, and I truly believe that the railway presents a fantastic opportunity for the UK to recover from this pandemic and emerge stronger and fit for the future. There's a massive opportunity for modal shift, to place a sustainable railway at the heart of the UK's economic recovery. It certainly is an exciting time to be working in the rail industry. But in the context of our industry change, there is an urgent crisis that dwarfs everything else, and that is the global climate crisis. And we have a crucial role to play. Do nothing is not an option. We must act now to ensure that we still have a railway for the future, for future generations. So my question to you all is this, will you join us and play your part in tackling the climate crisis and creating a truly sustainable railway? 
Are you ready for the ride? Let's go. So the first step on our journey is to look at what we're doing at Network Rail to become a sustainable organisation. So what are we doing? Well, in September last year, in 2020, we launched our ambitious environmental sustainability strategy. This is our commitment in the global fight for the environment, but the clock is ticking and we have no time to waste. Although we're starting from a relatively strong position in this race against time, we can't be complacent, nor can we underestimate the scale of the challenge. Rail is efficient and it's generally seen as environmentally sound by the public. Some of the busiest parts of our network have long been electrified and our emissions account for just 1.4% of UK carbon emissions. Rail can move millions of people quickly and cleanly over short or long distances in cities and in the countryside. And rail freight can move huge loads with a fraction of the impact of road transport. No other form of mass transport can do this. However, we can and must do more to reduce our emissions further and ultimately achieve net zero. At Network Rail, our vision around sustainability is quite straightforward, really. Quite simply, it's about putting our customers at the heart of what we do and serving the nation with the cleanest, greenest form of mass transport. We want people to choose to travel by rail and make greener transport choices. And we want to be a good neighbour too. Our railways are like the arteries of the nation that keep our economic heart beating. With an estate of 56,000 hectares, we're one of the largest landowners in the UK. And the impact that we have on the communities that we serve is really important. We connect people positively with these, we connect positively with these communities to add value and to encourage modal shift. We've therefore <coughs> recently published a social value framework which supports our environmental sustainability strategy. More on that later. step on our journey is to look in a bit more detail at the key areas of the strategy which are focused on four key pillars. Delivery of these pillars will lead us to a railway which cuts emissions to a minimum and tackles air quality, prepares our rail network for climate change, protects, strengthens and enhances our lying side habitats and limits the impact of waste and plastic pollution we create and moves us towards a more circular economy. Our next destination on the journey when we created the strategy was to visit our key stakeholders and ask them what they thought. We talked to passengers and the public and they told us that they thought we should be focusing on electrification to reduce carbon emissions, strengthening the resilience of our stations, tracks and trains to be able to cope with more extreme weather events, creating corridors for nature and carbon capture by planting more trees and eliminating waste to landfill. Over a third of the people we spoke to said that environment, including climate change, was in their top three most important global issues. My colleague Wendy Wheeler is also here today and will be talking you through more detail around science based carbon reduction. Uh, but I thought it would be useful for us to stop on our journey at each of the strategy pillars and highlight the key activities and milestones that we've committed to. So first up is the low emissions pillar. And here it's all about cutting out carbon. But it's no good just travelling hopefully in the right direction when tackling carbon emissions. We need to have a plan and we need to robustly measure our progress to getting to net zero. So in October 2020, we announced a major step forward on our journey to becoming the first railway company in the world to set the most ambitious science based targets to limit global warming to one and a half degrees C. We're focusing on transitioning our vehicle fleet so that by 2027, we'll be running off electric vehicles. We're working with industry partners on trialing hydrogen and battery trains. And I'm delighted that these are gonna be showcased at COP26 next month. 
and we're moving towards the use of renewable power in our operations and we've published our traction decarbonisation network strategy which sets out the options to support the reduction of diesel operations. We're also tackling air quality. We've recently concluded a trial uh, of air quality monitoring at Cricklewood, which provides us with real-time air quality data. And we're working with the RSSB on an air quality monitoring trial at 100 locations across the network. And this will help us to understand the scale of the challenge around air quality and to tackle the hotspots so that our passengers and staff can breathe better quality air every day. But we need your help. Innovation is key to tackling carbon reduction and we need to work with supply chain to get us to the end destination. So my ask of you, our supply chain partners, is to come with us, to come with us, with, to, to come to us with innovation and ideas and let's work together to tackle the challenge. So I mentioned earlier that our carbon emissions account for just 1.4% 1, 1 of the total UK carbon emissions. And that might sound like a small number, but it isn't, as you can see here. And we cannot stop until we've eliminated as much carbon from the railway as possible. And here you can see that we still have a long way to go with around 8 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent to get rid of. And our supply chain is absolutely key to us getting to that end destination on our journey. With scope three emissions accounting for 97% of our footprint, we need you to help us tackle this. So what you've just seen shows the true scale of the challenge and the vital role that our supply chain will play in helping us to achieve net zero ambitions. We've committed to reducing absolute scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions, those that are within our control, by 46% by 2029. We're reducing absolute scope three indirect emissions by 28% by 2029. And we're ensuring that 75% of our suppliers by emissions have set their own science-based targets by 2025. And this will enable us to reduce our total carbon emissions by 25% by 2024. Our energy reduction targets are also challenging and we've committed to reducing energy use by 18% by 2024. But this challenge is not all about carbon. More frequent and extreme weather conditions caused by climate change have a significant impact on our ability to run the railway safely and on time. Our weather resilience and climate change adaptation strategy has been in place since 2017 and we're making good progress in identifying and managing the key risks and areas of vulnerability across our estate. We have a robust risk-based approach to adaptation and we're building on this to embed long-term forward-looking adaptation into how we manage our infrastructure. We're embedding resilience into the way that we design, build, operate and maintain and replace our railway assets. Our mantra for replacing assets in the future will be replace like with better rather than replace like for like. This change will mean that we continually improve the network, making it more resilient for customers and passengers. And if we think that COVID-19 and climate, the climate crisis is a threat, that's actually nothing compared to what would happen if our ecosystem collapsed around us. <coughs> but we're in a very fortunate position to share our railway environment with a huge variety of plants, animals and habitats. And we must protect this biodiversity. Our estate extends to 56,000 hectares of land and we have over 7 million neighbours. Thanks to the Varley Review, published in November 2018, we're already making positive changes to the way that we manage biodiversity and land use planning. And we're moving away from just clearing vegetation on our line side to assessing the life on our land and on neighbouring land and working out how we can maintain and enhance it while still protecting the railway from risks to safety like falling trees. We've recently introduced groundbreaking satellite technology from the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology 
to measure habitats using aerial imagery. And this will help us achieve our overarching target of no net loss of biodiversity by 2024 and net gain by 2035. And we'll introduce annual natural capital reporting against a defined baseline by 2024. And we use lots of materials to build and maintain the rail network, spending around £7 billion per year on our supply chain. Our activities produce a lot of waste and we know that we have, have to use less and manage unavoidable waste better. To achieve this, we need to bring the whole industry along with us. We're setting high standards for our supply chain and we're working closely with our suppliers for example, to research and develop new innovative secondary materials and to reduce our reliance on virgin materials and discover new ways of designing and building assets to keep materials and resources in use for longer. We have a huge opportunity to contribute to a more circular economy where we extract fewer virgin resources from the planet, keep materials and resources in circulation and waste to an absolute minimum. And this action will also help us uh, significantly reduce our carbon emissions. So I mentioned social value earlier, and as we near the end of our journey today, we need to look at the importance of embedding good social value practice into everything we do. We're already doing some great work in this area. And when we spoke to stakeholders, nearly a third of the people we spoke to believe that the railway as an industry is making a positive contribution to society. But where next? We need to build on the positive social value that the railway generates and align with the government's social value model, which draws on the UN social development goals. We've therefore created this framework, which focuses on four key themes of economic prosperity, equal opportunity, well-being, and COVID recovery. Our framework showcases some great examples of value add activity that we're already delivering and helps our people and supply chain turn up the good. However, our priorities and plans supporting them can only be delivered successfully if we're an organisation that is enabled to succeed. So we've identified six key enablers that will support the delivery of our priorities and ambitions <coughs> around our people, funding and planning, having the right systems and processes in place, um, and looking at good engagement with key stakeholders. Using new technology and innovation is going to be critical to our ability to deliver our ambitions. We can be innovative within our own organisation and working with partners across the industry. If we signal to the market that we want new solutions to our challenges, our supply chain will respond as you have done and we can make greener and cleaner choices. And our passengers and public want to know how we're currently affecting their environment. So we should be open and transparent about our performance. As I look at the journey ahead and I feel rather anxious, after all future generations are really relying on us. But then I think about the journey we've all been on during the pandemic. And if we look at what was achieved in such a short space of time with the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine programme, I know that anything is possible. I find it truly incredible that in the space of less than 12 months, we were three vaccines approved for rollout, and it's been essential to enable us to break out of lockdown and start moving forward with our lives. Just think what might be possible applying the same drive and determination to the challenges of the climate crisis in rail. We're passionate about making our railway the greenest it can be and we have an opportunity to act now to leave a positive environmental legacy for future generations. Today we can help passengers and freight users make greener choices and support communities by being a good neighbour, looking after our land and keeping our air clean. We're uniquely positioned to help our nations build back better and greener after this pandemic, helping the UK to meet its ambitious net zero carbon targets and build a strong, sustainable economy. So just finishing off my journey with you today and returning to my opening statement. 
We're on a journey to be the cleanest, greenest form of mass transport in the UK, but we cannot do this alone. We need all of the stakeholders to be on this journey with us. And therefore, I have one ask of you to join us, to commit to ta taking action now to eliminate fossil carbon from our operations and to achieve net zero as soon as possible. Thank you. Very much, yeah. One second. Uh, so, if you're in the remote audience, uh, we do have time for about three or four minutes of questions. If you're in the remote audience, uh, my colleague Carl uh, has access to the chat and then he's going to grab a mic now, so he'll be able to ask your questions to Joel directly. Um, and if there's anybody in the room, yeah, yeah, please do. Please do. If there's anybody in the room who has any questions to Joel, yes? I'm Tim Brown, uh, GBR Rail. I think you, you, there was one of the slides that said electrification investment decision 2029. What's plan B if it uh, doesn't go ahead? So it's a massive challenge for us, Tim, as you know, um, and, and one that's not necessarily within our control. We're working really closely with the department on the different options that are available to us. So we put, in, put together the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy that focuses on what the art of the possible is, um, but ultimately it's, it's not within our gift to make that decision. So, uh, so in terms of Plan B, this is why we need to think creatively, we need to look at alternative options that are available to us. Okay, it could be Mars or the Moon, if we don't do something. Mm. Hi, Michael here from Alstom. Um, you mentioned TDMS, and it obviously it's in the slides and everything else. Um, it was sort of published in 2020, wasn't it? It wasn't fully published. It's the interim business case that came out. Yeah. We now see development of the WISP, which should translate into the GBR future strategy. Um, it was a 30 year strategy, it doesn't appear to have really been embraced, and, and we're now looking at a new 30 year strategy. To what extent? Should we place our bets on TNS? So we're looking, as you say, the WISP is looking at the, the kind of 30 year look ahead. And part of that is looking at the environment and sustainability and part of that is traction decarbonisation. I really feel there's a re renewed enthusiasm and energy, if you pardon the pun, around this to get it to tackle it. Um, you know, the WISP is there, the whole industry strategic plan, I think, and that is the key. This is looking now at whole industry. It's something that's always been a massive challenge, I think, for our industry because it's been so fragmented. Um, but I think bringing it together under one umbrella, under GBR, is going to give us that opportunity that we haven't had for, for, the, for, the, for the past kind of few decades. More of the key challenges of the electrification that we've seen that makes it look relatively less attractive is the cost. Uh, what's, uh, is there any strategy or plan that will create to make it attractive? For yeah, I think it's fair to say that, that a lot of lessons have been learned um, from projects recently. Um, and that is an area that we're really focusing on. It's driving down the cost of delivering these kinds of schemes. Um, and I think we're using that those lessons that we've learned to help us on that journey. Probably well, just time for one more quick one, if there's any more in the audience. Yes. Hi, it's uh, Richard from our case. Um, you mentioned load shift uh, as well. That's obviously a, a, a really important one. Um, and we're having to kind of rebuild that load of shift and encourage people back onto it in a way, which is you know, that's going to be a huge part of that decarbonisation push. Is there a, a strategy from network around how we're going to encourage passenger approach more? Um, because it sort of shifts in terms of patterns and working weeks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, this this whole concept of modal shift will be a lot easier in the new world when we're under one umbrella. 
I think we've struggled sometimes with joining up the various component pieces of transport and we look we need to look at this as a network actually far wider than just the rail the rail industry we need to make it easier for people to make those green travel choices and to make the connection from start to finish of their journey as smooth and seamless as possible so that involves us working with other transport organizations um, but I do think there's a massive opportunity there around modal shift and also you know the freight opportunity as well. We need to get more freight off the roads and onto the rail, and we can do that. You know, so that is something that we're focusing on. We don't have the answer yet, um, but we're moving forward with that. Thanks. That brings us to time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, round of applause once more. <laughs> uh, I'd now like to introduce John Constable from our event sponsors, TP Group. <laughs> All right, yes. Click through the wrong ones. Hello, everyone. Oh, that's loud. It's the first time I've presented to people as well, so it's uh, it's a bit of a change. Having done it many times at university through STEM events, having be in front of people again after two years is uh, it's quite something different. So today's conference is very much around technology and innovation. So I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about the technology and innovation side of uh, of rail, and hopefully spark some debates for the later panels today. Um, so we've got panels on different traction technologies. We're involved in the hydrogen panel and, and there are other ones going on as well. So I think we need to be, debate very much, you know, how do we get to net zero and what are we going to do? It's legally binding to get to 2050, as we all know, and actually there are many, uh, many strategies to bring that date forward. The car industry is working to much earlier dates, rail are working to, to progress as well, and obviously in Scotland it's an even earlier date than 2050. So there's a lot for us to do to get there. And I guess the opening question I have is, can rail meet its targets? Uh, noting we're new kids on the block, we've come from a defence background, an aviation background into this sector. Many of you obviously are, have been in the rail sector for many years. And from an outside in kind of perspective, I look at it and think rail is already, as Joe has eloquently put, incredibly low carbon comparatively to say the haulage industry or to other industries. So what do we need to do to take it to the next level? And actually, uh, keying off some of Joe's points, actually, that if you think about the peripheral industries around rail, it's not just about the, the trains, the tracks, it's actually about the vehicles, the infrastructure, the buildings, the environment. There's a whole load of other things around that that actually have got to travel the same journey to net zero. So I guess rail, for me, actually kind of looks at the round picture, not just ne necessarily where perhaps we focus on trains and tracks. So just briefly, I won't labour this too much. The so TP Group, we, we traditionally work in the defence aviation uh, and now we are a supplier into the rail market. We have been working with the partners on the Hydroflex programme. We're also doing some safety case work into the Dragonfly programme as well. So for us, we see hydrogen, but also generally the green economy as a big, big important area, not only for business, but also for us generally as, um, as stakeholders in our communities. So many of these projects are landmark and first of class. The reality is we've got to do many of these first of class projects, which are going to be challenging, they're going to be innovative, they're going to be difficult, but we've got to get through those to get to the point where actually we can see the technology work, prove it, and as we come to um, some of the other areas within that, we're looking at safety cases. How do we make these new technologies work safely? Uh, I suppose I need to be careful with the word new technologies. Hydrogen has actually been around a long time. so. Part of the business that I run, we've been producing electrolyzers which produce hydrogen. We've been producing those since 1957. So it's not new technology. Fuel cells were invented in 1863 by a chap in Wales. So it's not new technology. It's now a new application of that. I'm going to skip through to those. So. Think about the challenges, and I imagine many of you know the challenges much more than me and that your rail operators, network rail, obviously you're involved in that. But where I look at it kind of outside in again, the, the network we have is elderly in many cases. Some of it's Victorian. There are specific challenges around that. So track gauges, tunnels, um, just track lines, uh, civil infrastructure, all of those things are fixed. We can't change those things particularly easily, and I guess the costs of change are huge. So 
you look at that and go, well, that's a challenge we've got to overcome. If we want to get to net zero, then electrification is clearly the right answer in most cases because it is already happening, it's being rolled out, and it is, it is carbon, ne carbon neutral in that sense. If you think about some of the other lines around the country, some of the other areas, so perhaps north of Scotland, perhaps north of Wales, perhaps islands and highlands, those are areas where today diesel trains are much more prevalent, and those are the areas where obviously interest is in decarbonising them. But notwithstanding that, it's also the challenges, as we said, around the local infrastructure. So we come into digitisation is the solution for the challenges. How do we digitally understand what's happening with the local environment and the rail? And Joe's mentioned air monitoring actually earlier. That's an area that, uh, as a business, we're involved in in the defence sector, air monitoring, air management, understanding how clean is the air we're breathing. Birmingham New Street Station being an area where poor air quality is well known. So applying digitisation, artificial intelligence, machine learning to understand what's going on and figure out how we solve those problems. How do we use um, digital twinning? How do we use modelling to help us understand that? So I, I see that as a, as, a, as a first point. That's going to help us start to think about it. The next one is regulation. So some of the programmes we're working on, they're new, as I said, innovative, difficult, they're first of class, so the regulations don't exist. So how do you get a new train with a new technology onto the, onto the tracks? How do you get new vans from from the production line to locally and get them working? How do you then understand the training aspect? So how do we know that people can be conversion trained? I mean, I guess a simple one I think of is RAC. You know, if you break down, obviously RAC come out and support us. They're having to do a lot of cross training on electric vehicles because servicing internal combustion engines has been known for many, many years, but you move to high voltage electrics in cars and it's a completely different market. And I think these are the challenges that we, we're going to face. Um, but they also present opportunities as well, because then that means we've got a lot of chance to upskill our people, bring bring new people in, bring people from perhaps um, industries that are going to suffer. So oil and gas is an area that may suffer as renewables get so. But actually, if we can converge and train across, what it means is that we, we keep that skill base. Skill base. And the infrastructural challenges that we've got, electrification is expensive. I've seen various figures that, that kind of look at a million pounds a kilometre, a million pound a mile, you know, a lot of money to be invested on that. And if we really want to electrify lots and lots of track, that's quite a lot of money. And actually, then I kind of look at, is the uh, is the grid going to be good enough? And I can't answer that question, but actually I look at it and think logically, if we, if we electrify more of the rail network <coughs> and we electrify more of our cars and we electrify more of other things, then all of a sudden the demands for us on, on electric power is actually going to be pretty tough. And we need to think about that. I mean, they think about the infrastructural challenges. How do you get more charging points close to your rail network bases? How do you get um, in charging points for where customers need to use their cars, let alone the power you need to run the train? So I think there are a lot of other things around that we need to think about as we decarbonise. Again, probably keys off Joe's points quite, quite uh, succinctly and that there is a holistic approach to how we decarbonise and how we use these technologies working together. So I've probably talked a little bit about some of these, but green energy is um, as you know, it's been, we've had renewables for a long time now. Um, there's a lot of work done on solar farms and wind farms over the last 10, 15 years. Regulations there, lots more being built. I was down in Brighton recently, looked across from the pier. There are many more wind farms than I remember being there 10 years ago. So what we're seeing is that, you know, it's happening, which is great because it provides more electricity and we are going to need more electricity, not just for railways and tracks, but also for all the other things that we're looking to electrify, even home heating, as I hear people talk about, which I still don't understand, but that's that's one area. But as we move forward, the safety and reliability is going to be paramount. So hydrogen, battery technologies, other technologies in trains, how do we know they're safe? Every single one of us gets in a car, gets on a train, gets on a plane, and we just assume it's safe. We just trust it's safe, and it is, but we've got to get there. So. The technology challenges are how do we make those things safe and how do we make sure that they are reliably safe as well so that every time you get on it you can get from a to b you can do your journey because i you know general public pays for a ticket gets on the train and expects to get off the other end on time uh, in that sense um, the technologies that we that we see so batteries hydrogen hybrids as you said they're not new but they're they're not scaled in most instances, they're actually quite small scale. 
So in our native markets, we put uh, electrolyzer machines to create oxygen, we put them on nuclear submarines. Been around a long time, but they're small. How do you take that to a large scale infrastructure plant where you need tens of megawatts worth of energy to produce tons of hydrogen to make a train work? How do we scale up batteries from, you know, I suppose traditionally we're looking at kind of our phones, these kind of things, we're looking for batteries in these to be as small as possible, but actually to move into the rail sector and to put batteries on trains, it's a scale up. How do you get a power density? How do we make them successful? And I think then it comes to there isn't a mad, there isn't a silver bullet for any of this. What we're going to find is that all of these technologies are necessary. So actually, the the Hydroflex program is a is a hybrid train, as I'm sure many people know. It is electric and hydrogen power. I think there are other programs as well that are going on. They will also be hybrid type situations, and actually also ask ourselves, can we get more from the diesel trains? So actually, we've got 30 year lifespan on a, on a train, maybe more. We've got them in service, rather than take those off, put new ones on. Can we reconfigure those? Can we make those last longer? Can we do stuff with that? Well, actually, we probably can. That's possibly cheaper than wholesale replacement. So I think there are, again, no magic bullets. We've got to look at all the technologies and blend them in. So hydrogen's role is part of the decarbonisation strategy. It will work in some regions successfully. It won't in other regions. Uh, there is a debate as whether hydrogen is good enough for um, for freight trains. There are some technologies out there. I know a couple of companies are working on some really yeah. incredible replacement engines to work with with the fuel for freight trains, which I think is pretty cool when I look at it actually. And I think that will make a big difference. Um, but it's also about linking communities. So if we kind of look at hub and spoke models, so how we see the world of hydrogen and how that feeds in is, you know, you'll have mega plants like refineries somewhere, but actually you'll need to have some local production because it makes more sense. Renewables are distributed. They're around the country. We can plug into the grid. We can pay for green electricity. We can then generate locally what we need, which means we can then power um, the local communities. So not just um, trains and rail depots, but actually then you can power your transport depots, we can power buses, we can power cars. So it becomes much more of a, again, a holistic approach to using it and actually to make hydrogen successful economically in the rail market or any market, it's about volume as with any fuel. So what we've got to do is we've got to get to a position where there's enough offtake to make it viable, which will then drive the, the costs down, which will then improve the supply chain. Um, and uh, standing as part of the supply chain, you know, that's something that we need. That's something all the businesses need really is the volume to come up. The prices will come down and we start to see see movement on that. Um, and then hydrogen, it is safe and lots of people think of Hindenburg. Lots of people think of other other kind of areas where hydrogen's perhaps been seen as dangerous. But actually it's been used in refiner refineries in oil and gas for, for years, 50, 60, 70, probably longer years, very successfully. Um, well, I say we've used it successfully for years. Fuel cells aren't new, so it isn't that dangerous. It's just about how you manage it. And I guess I always look at things like natural gas. You know, you come home, turn your turn your boiler on, you just expect it to work and have no problems. But as grown up, I remember the adverts on television where you know if you smell gas, don't flick the switch. So what we should remember is that it is a dangerous gas, but we just know how to manage it, and we've been living with it for so many years. So I think the reality is, you know, I see. Um, and I think others in the industry also see that hydrogen is, it is safe and it is how we roll it out that's going to be important, which comes back to training, development and knowledge and doing the safety and the regulation. So unlocking the technologies, numerous technologies there, lots of people are in the supply chain are working on them. Uh, we've got partners working with us on fuel cell development. Fuel cells are, get, are getting big enough to run trains. Um, fuel cells are used to power ships. Early, early defence examples. So they're getting there in terms of size and scale up. Battery technology is coming on uh, lots and lots and we're seeing that move forward. Obviously, battery electric cars, battery electric trucks. There are battery electric trains moving ahead. So the technologies are, are coming along. What they need is investment, and I think from a supply chain point of view, one of the things that's critical is continued investment in the innovation. Um, you know, if I talk about me, my personal opinion, I'd love to see UK PLC lead the world in most of these areas. And actually, if we invest in that, we're able to drive that forward so that we can export. You know, in a brave new world, we find ourselves in the political state, being able to export our technologies and our IP globally 
is something that will make a big difference to our country. And I think, you know, for me, what I'm proud of is that we should be able to stand up and say, we did this, we made it successful, and we have technologies that other people, other countries want to buy from us. Optimization of how we use the system is probably the last point I want to think about. So with the advent of machine learning, um, 5G, interconnectivity, Internet of Things, what that brings is the ability for us to manage our assets in a completely different way. We can then look at optimization. So how do we use these, these, um, these trains, these vehicles? How do we use them in a much more efficient way? How do we harness the data? Um, unfortunately, uh, kind of looking at data lakes and data pools, we, we as, um, as a culture now collect data for everything, tons and tons of data. The reality of it is how much of it is useful. So I think getting the right data and using that to enable us to manage where we want to go has got to be one of the key strategies because that will then inform whether these new technologies are working. And if they're not, we will change them because by virtue of continuous improvement. So I think the data piece there and, and technologies around machine learning enable us to understand that. Even down to things like service and maintenance schedules, traditionally, um, even in our industry, it's what we see in aviation and defence is that someone turns up with a list of parts to fit, it goes and fits it, I haven't got all the parts, it's a problem, you can't do that job, you have to stop. But if you apply some digital technology, you can know ahead of the game whether you've got a problem, you can know whether you've got all the materials you need, you can know whether you've got the right resources, the right skill level, which means you can plan and you can change your plans quickly. So again, applying a different thinking also is going to help us bring these new technologies to the fore because they are going to have issues. Anything that you do that's new is going to have an issue at some point and it's just about what you do about it and how you manage it. So kind of a lead in thought really is, is really some questions and perhaps some of these questions are really great for the panel later in terms of, you know, what do we actually need in infrastructure? It's probably a phased approach. How do we do that? How do we get the skills we need? All of these new technologies are demanding um, engineering, and innovation and technology. And uh, as an employer, as a manufacturer and employer of engineers, we find that getting hold of good engineers is difficult. It is difficult, it is a challenge. Um, how do we cross train? How do we attract people to our industries? How do we bring those people in so that we can continue on this journey? Because again, as Joe said in her, her opening speech around the holistic approach. There's so many things we need to do to get to net zero by 2050, and not just the, the kind of the narrow focus of um, we need to replace our train or replace our car, it's the whole infrastructure piece. So I think there is a whole skills debate that hangs off the back of this, and one that we see regularly, uh, and then regulations and all that kind of good stuff. So I mean, I think these are the areas that, that I'd like to see debated in the panels. You know, there's lots of people out there in the audience with lots of experience and knowledge in these areas, and I think coming together as an industry that enables us to be successful. We have time for a few quick questions, but I'd also like to note that John is chairing the hydrogen technologies panel later, so if you really want to grill him, then go along to that panel, but you can get more than three hour technical answers, I'm sure. Um, anything from the report on you as well? No, we're still waiting. Uh, go on online, uh, ask, ask some questions. Uh, yeah, just pop them in the chat if you're online and you'd like to ask questions for anybody in the room. We'd like to uh, ask a question of John's for you now. Well, that was interesting because I won't be in. We got one here. I won't be in your uh, session later. I'm doing one of the other ones, but I noted that energy storage wasn't in your technological challenges slide. Ah, uh, yes. Is that because there's enormous tanks of hydrogen and no. these back garden? No, 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 absolutely not. No, it, energy storage is a big problem. I mean, um, renewables, generating all the electricity out there. I mean, we're actually containing many wind turbines most of the time. So there's a whole lot of electricity and energy that it's not kind of wasted, but it's not utilized. So, you know, if we were to, to operate the turbines more often and store the energy as hydrogen, then that does feed into the market. And that you know, provides extra volume of hydrogen, which hopefully brings the price down as well. So, you know, there are some things there, but then battery storage as well. You know, I know there are businesses that are taking old uh, EV car batteries and putting them in containers and creating storage devices. So there is a huge market around that. But again, the technologies I think are, are challenged because there's also limits on how much hydrogen you can store. So you need to work through that. I think that one from the audience is the question. We want to expose one of those containers though. Just on the fuel cell, that's that. Oh, sorry, we're just going to have a text. Uh, 
Yeah, you just mentioned that the technology is coming along with your sales at this point. What, what sort of constraints and technology growth there and, and what are the, the, the challenges in, in, in making the fuel cell scale to a commercial operation on the train? Yes, I mean, into the into the kind of weeds of the detail, there's a key component in the in the, the cell stack inside the fuel cells, and it's to do with current density. So the limitation limiting factor is typically the materials in terms of how much current can I put through there. So you pass a current through, and you convert the water into hydrogen and oxygen, and the fuel cells used in reverse, um, and that's the limiting factor. It's it's coming on. There are units up to 300 kilowatts now in terms of very large fuel cells. Um, and I think really it's just, you know, we've seen a number of the companies that supply them have scaled from kind of 30 kilowatts up to 100, we're moving to 125, 150, 300. Um, but then I think there is a point where you look at and go from a redundancy point of view, you know, traditionally we might have one engine because that works I and mean, you have a breakdown failure mode with a fuel cell solid state technology, actually you could probably have two or three smaller ones so that you can still travel. So I think there's probably a balance in terms of scale of the technology versus uh, bringing in more smaller modules, if you like, because it's a much more modular approach than, than an IC engine, where obviously you have a whole load of other services you need. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to wrap that up there. So we'll round of applause. Uh, we now have something a little bit different. Uh, that causes our keynote addresses. We have three elevator pitches. Each pitch is four minutes long, and the company is sort of pitching between the to present a new product or service. Um, after four minutes, I'll come up with some sort of crook and tear them from the stage. That's a warning to my presenters not to run over. Um, and these guys have all taken exhi exhibition tables outside. So if you have any questions, there's no time for questions here. Please go and see them outside and grill more their technology and service. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite Dan up from uh, the DER Scotland Industrialisation Centre. Stopwatch starts the second one. Come on, stopwatch. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Daniel Cutting. I'm uh, from the DER Industrialisation Centre Scotland, or Derek Scotland for short. I'd like to start off by thanking Joe and John for the opening speeches. I think they've done a really good job of setting the scene um, for why we exist. So we were established by UK Research and Innovation last year, um, as the UK government recognised that as electrification is a big opportunity here in the UK and globally, that the UK would like to maintain a footing in <coughs> terms of supplying into those markets and obviously the growth opportunity that presents. So we've heard an awful lot tomorrow, I suppose, about hydrogen and battery. For us, our key um, area that we're focused on is power electronics, machines and drives. So for those that aren't familiar with that, it's any technology which for power electronics converts one electricity into another type uh, for electrical machines, electricity into kinetic energy or the other way around. Um, and then drives is all around putting controls around those technologies. So for us, the, the vision really is to make sure that the UK um, is globally recognised, continues to be globally recognised and increases our recognition, I suppose, globally um, in power electronics, machines and drive supply chain. The way that we're going to do that, I suppose, is by pulling together a, a collection of existing um, partners, uh, which I'll go through in a second. We've also had an, uh, sorry, investment from UK Research and Innovation, um, around about £30 million of new equipment to fill in some key gaps the industry told us we had in the UK so that we can help scale up um, and support the, the supply chain. As I mentioned, there is a, an existing network of partners which make up the, the, the Derrick group. We already have around £300 million pounds worth of, of capability in the UK across 30 partners, which are universities and RTOs. We have a regional setup, so we have one here in Scotland and then there are three others uh, in England and Wales. We don't carry a regional focus, so here in Scotland, we're happy to work with anyone in the UK and globally. We carry, a, I suppose, a, a sectoral focus or a capability focus. So for us in Scotland, it's high power, high integrity, um, which leads us on to our interest in, in the real industry, obviously. We have five, um, sorry, four <coughs> university partners in Scotland and then a number of facilities and groups that, that work with them. Um, so the University of Glasgow are uh, a group which focuses on uh, power electronics, so um, semiconductor devices. The University of Edinburgh look at the machine side of things. Here at Strathclyde, there's the machine element as well, uh, power electronics too, and then um, the, the systems experience that, that Strathclyde has. And then finally, the University of St Andrews with the hydrogen accelerator brings the hydrogen focus, so recognising that 
we can't just think about powertrains without thinking about what the uh, energy vector would be. Um, with all of them, there are a number of other facilities, such as the, the PNDC, uh, which is just up in Cumbernauld, historically an energy systems demonstration centre, um, working with DNOs, now moving into transport. For us, I mean, as I mentioned, it's high power, high integrity, so there are Rail is one of, of a few sectors that we're focused on, uh, and a really big part of DER is driving that cross-sector collaboration. So bringing together supply chains that maybe prior, uh, previously haven't worked on other sectors. My role in an industrial engagement sense is to try and understand and identify where there's overlap, uh, whether that's working with um, people at a platform level or at a supplier level. <laughs> so for us, it's everything from design design for manufacture, and then looking right through at device, subsystem and system level in terms of helping with innovation and test. Uh, and then we have two test facilities coming online in the next couple of years to help us test the platform. So what I would say is if you're interested in either finding suppliers or as a supplier, finding people to work with to grow your uh, customer base and, and then share your capability, um, we're here to help network and do that. We are front door to all these centres. So if I can't help you here in Scotland, there are three other centres, which I'm sure we have capability to do so. Four minutes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Now I invite uh, Natalie from GBR Rail. Hi, <laughs> I'm Natalie Cartwright. Um, at GBR Rail, we specialise in rail depot maintenance equipment. So anything from concept of design through to commissioning and ongoing maintenance. Um, and it's this um, industry experience that has given us an in-depth knowledge of the issues around maintenance in depots. Um, and it's enabled us to think of innovative solutions in terms of the safety and the efficiency of depot operations. Clear track on screen is just such a solution. We believe that ClearTrack will be the future state of the art to replace the CET for train toilet maintenance. Currently on trial with Chiltern Railways, we have two further prototype trials planned for with an overseas operator and an OEM before commercialisation in 2023. So what does ClearTrack do? ClearTrack operates while the train is in passenger service. It treats train toilet waste. It purifies and recycles liquid waste into, um, it, sorry, it purifies and recycles liquid waste. It processes solid waste into a biochar, which is an inert byproduct. It mitigates stored water hygiene risks by treating Weight by treating water on board into a potable quality standard. It operates independently of the sewage network, so no connection to the sewage network is needed. It doesn't pass on its waste to anyone else. It doesn't discharge it and it doesn't pass it on to an agency, another agency. ClearTrack looks very much like a conventional CT system, but that's where the similarity ends. It has the same size footprint as a CET. It can be underslung or it can be fitted internally in the toilet cubicle. It can be installed onto new trains and it can be retrofitted onto older legacy fleets. At half the weight of a CET system, it lightweights the train. It reduces energy consumption, wear and tear on the track, and as a result, CO2 emissions. And it can really make a very big difference to a depot for the future. The really complicated, logistically difficult process of dealing with train toilet waste and depot is removed from the routine schedule. There's no requirement for specialist CET infrastructure on depots, on service aprons. So a simplification in service apron design is one of the byproducts. No extensions needed for further and longer trains. So if you're increasing your fleet size, you don't have to think about increasing your CET size. And for depots overall, there's a huge difference in the number of maintenance connections to water capacity, mains water, electricity connections and sewage network connections. 
So clear track really does signal an end to the resource hungry and logistically complicated process of dealing with train toilet waste. It removes firstly the very unpleasant and onerous task of dealing with train toilet waste. And also that is normally and normally happens at night. So that whole process um, goes away. No shunting required to move trains around the depot, which can be quite considerable if a, if a train ends up at the wrong depot. There's a reduction, as I said, in track wear and tear, a reduction in noise, air and light pollution, because actually that process doesn't happen at night. So it's very beneficial for neighbours. I'm sure they'd be very, very pleased. There's a reduction in emissions too, and no more operatives will be exposed to raw sewage. So clear track in numbers, um, data will be coming through during the six month trial, but at the moment what we do already know is that there are about 10,000 toilets on the GB rail network. And that means with CT tanks having to be emptied at least every other day, um, that's 1.825 million CT emptings a year. With clear track, which only needs emptying once every three months, that's only 40,000. To operate train toilets annually, you need about 440 million litres of water. Clear track recycles and reuses water for hand washing and flushing, and so it reduces that number by 85%. Discharge water, which equals the same 440 million litres, does not go into the sewage network with clear track. Oh, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Okay, clear track makes an incredible difference to the resilience and the sustainability of the railways. <laughs> and last but not least, I'd like to invite you to die next. Good morning, I'm Rupert Stevens and I'm the uh, product group leader for Power Assemblies at Dynex. Dynex is a manufacturer of electrical heat assemblies for high power applications and has provided electronics to the rail industry for over 60 years from its base in Lincoln. Dynex has two parallel six inch wafer lines producing IGBT, thyristor, and dive devices. The lines have a combined capacity of around 80,000 wafers per year, processing from base silicon wafer all the way through to package devices. Dynex also designs, manufactures and tests high power converter assemblies for use in rail, grid and industrial applications. Dynex is a dedicated group of R&D engineers who progress our core conventional silicon product, both at chip and packaging level, but are also developing wide band gap semiconductors bespoke low induction packaging outlines. These alternative modules enable novel converter topologies to achieve higher switching speeds and better efficiency. The development of these packages is a key technology to enable <coughs> decarbonisation, providing lightweight, efficient replacements for conventional power electronics. The Power Assemblies Group at Dynex provides a bespoke design service for power converters for a range of industries and we've provided the design manufacturer for the GBRF Class 73 modernisation programme, replacing the 1960s traction equipment with the modern day equivalent. The Power Assemblies Group manufactures assemblies for other decarbonising industries such as hydroelectricity and power factor correction based on thyristor and IGPT technology. Many of our engineers come from a device background and using their in-depth knowledge of device physics and wear-out mechanisms, they're well placed to design high reliability converter solutions. We also have experienced rail engineers who are familiar with the challenges of approvals and implementation in the traction environment. So really, I'm here today for a, to ask you to challenge us. Combining our custom module and power assemblies design capability, Dynex would like to play a bigger role in the low carbon agenda for rail. We'd like to expand our capability beyond conventional technologies and partner with system integrators and academic groups to find novel solutions to enable decarbonisation. We'll be exhibiting layers today. I look forward to building collaborations with you. Thank you very much.